Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Ron Kisen Stevenson. Good evening. There's a concept known as spiritual materialism. Uh, and that means when one is so identified with and clings to a sense of spiritual identity. Spiritual materialism has been likened in various writings to golden chains. In the myth of freedom and the way of meditation, Chogam uh, uh, Trungpa writes the following. I'll read you this passage. As long as we follow a spiritual approach promising salvation, miracles, liberation, then we are bound by the golden chain of spirituality. Such a chain might be beautiful to wear, but nonetheless, it imprisons us. As long as one's approach to spirituality is based on enriching ego, then it is spiritual materialism. And by ego, of course, he means that sense of an enduring sense of self. All the promises we have heard are pure seduction. We expect the teachings to solve our problems. We expect to be provided with magical means to deal with our depressions, our aggressions, our hang-ups. But to our surprise, we begin to realize this is not going to happen. It's very disappointing to realize that we must work on ourselves and our suffering rather than depend upon a savior or a magical power of yogic techniques. It's disappointing to realize we have to give up our expectations rather than build on the basis of our preconceptions. We would like to watch ourselves attain enlightenment, watch our disciples celebrating, worshiping, throwing flowers at us with miracles and earthquakes occurring and gods and angels singing and so forth. This never happens. The attainment of enlightenment from ego's point of view is extreme death. The death of self, the death of me and mine, the death of the watcher. It is the ultimate and final disappointment. Treading the spiritual path is painful. It's a constant unmasking, peeling off layer after layer of masks. It involves insult after insult. So the search for enlightenment can be a golden chain. I started thinking about gold itself. What's so glorious about gold anyway? And we all know that it's ornamental and it's rare. So somehow it became synonymous with value in our societies. Um, the gold standard, the gold prize. But the value, as we all know, isn't intrinsic to the mineral. The notion of value is conditioned on its rarity and desirability. In other words, its value depends on the inability of most people to successfully hoard and store it. Its value is a function of inequality, privilege, and class status. Who controls the rare minerals and the commodities yields power. Our particular economic system prioritizes the hoarding of such objects over and above human welfare. As a consequence of this fetishism, the entire society learns to value gold and devalue human and sentient life. So in Asia, you can find Buddhist temples with the most beautiful golden Buddhas, and you can encounter lay people worshiping or petitioning with prayer these Buddhas. To a, a Buddhist practitioner from the West, this originally seemed to me as a perversion. After all, the Buddha was teaching that the conditioned world's impermanent. And this self 
that we pray for has no intrinsic value and is also impermanent. But they are no more stuck in materialism than we, spiritual materialism. The social matrix conditions our values. Spiritual materialism is, of course, a perversion of our values. Sometimes we take comfort in the trappings of religion rather than the essence of practice. We enshrine beliefs rather than open ourselves to the uncomfortable unknown. These enshrined beliefs become our golden chains, chaining us to ego identification. And as we know from Buddha Sutta, there are three uh, main forms of clinging, and those are clinging to beliefs, rituals and observations, and a sense of an enduring self. So every time we like an online post or a, a meme because it reinforces that belief that we revere, we're adding a jewel to our golden chain. We can even leave a comment there if we like and to show that we already knew that. Or we could have written it better. We can nitpick a little bit in the comments if we like. And every time we read a meme that reinforces our views, again, we forge a new chain in the link. So Buddhism's four noble truths prioritize acceptance of what is over our expectations. As uh, Rinpoche says, insult after insult to our expectations. There's no comfortable place for the self. So we tell ourselves, well, peace and happiness are just around the bend, just after that current impediment, whether through blind faith or just ex exasperation, we postpone our peace and happiness. We put it off because they couldn't possibly be found here and now amid all these arising problems, and when will they stop? But then again, there's never just one impediment, is there? And then as soon as one is conquered, another one arises. So peace and happiness themselves are just holy expectations, golden chains, binding us to the notion of comfort, ego comfort. And how do we cut these chains? Well, according to the suttas, we, through our practice, become aware of them through constant self-based uh, observation. Uh, let's take a look at the Udesa Vibhanga Sutta, MN 138. The Blessed One said this, a monk should investigate in such a way that his consciousness is neither externally scattered and diffused nor internally positioned. Um, he would, from lack of clinging, be unagitated. When his consciousness is neither externally scattered and diffused nor internally positioned, from lack of clinging, there, he would be unagitated. There is no seed for conditions of future birth, aging, death, stress. And how is consciousness said to be scattered and diffused? There is the case where a form is seen with the eye and the consciousness follows the drift of it or flows after the drift of it. The theme of the form is tied to the attraction to the theme of the form. It's chained to the attraction of the theme of the form. It's fettered and joined to the attraction of the theme of the form. Consciousness then is said to be externally scattered and diffused. And as the senses attach themselves to external stimuli, there's also the attachment to internal stimuli, such as beliefs and notions of self from the same sutta. And how is the mind to be said, said to be internally positioned? There is the case where a monk 
quite withdrawn from sensuality, withdrawn from unskillful mental qualities, enters and remains in the first jhana, the first um, absorption. Rapture and pleasure born from withdraw withdrawal, pardon, accompanied by directed thought and evaluation. His consciousness follows the drift of rapture and pleasure born of withdrawal, is tied to, chained, and fettered, and joined to the attraction and the rapture and pleasure born of withdrawal. So we all know that when we meditate, one of the obstacles we sometimes face are distractions. We'll hear a car outside or a machine, uh, a noise, and we'll get distracted. Um, but of course, you know, in my first uh, Sushin, uh, there was someone next to me who was breathing very heavy, and I complained about it. And, uh, you know, that was early in the, in the retreat. Um, what we do is incorporate that into our meditation. Otherwise, we're not really meditating. We're just shutting things out. So that's why when we meditate, our eyes are half open and half closed. When we are aware of what's happening outside, but not attached, not following it, and we're aware of what arises inside. So, the question of self will continue to arise in our mind stream. And so, I'd like to conclude first with a reminder that Dogen famously said, to study the self is to forget the self. And uh, I will conclude with some lyrics from a song called Magic Mirror, appropriately enough for a, a Buddhist talk, uh, from Leon Russell's 1972 album, Carney. It's a kind of a quirky album. But the song asks two very interesting questions. Do I find myself in anyone I see? And do I try to see myself as others would? It gets to the root of selfness. Is myself anything solid or real, or is it imputed by prior conditioning and expectations? And what sense of self do I, in turn, impute to others? Is this self also intrinsic, or is this also a series of expectations? And here's the lyrics. Standing by the highway, suitcase by my side. There's no place I want to go. Just thought I'd catch a ride. Many people look my way and many pass me by. In moments of reflection, I wonder why. To the thieves, I am a bandit. To the mothers, I'm a son. To the preachers, I'm a sinner. Lord, I'm not the only one. To the sad ones, I'm unhappy. To the losers, I'm a fool. To the teachers, I'm a student. To teachers, I'm in school. To the hobos, I'm imprisoned by everything I own. To the soldier, I'm just someone else who's dying to go home. The general sees a number, a politician's tool. To my friends, I'm just an equal in this whirlpool. To policemen, I'm suspicious. It's in the way I look. I'm just another character to fingerprint and book. To the censors, I'm pornography with no redeeming grace. To the hooker, I'm a customer without a face. The sellers think I'm merchandise. They'll have me for a song. The left ones think I'm right. The right ones think I'm wrong. And many people look my way and many pass me by. And in my quiet reflection, I wonder why. Magic mirror, won't you tell me please? Do I see myself in anyone I meet? Magic mirror, if we only could try to see ourselves as others would. So practice is our magic mirror. And how well do we wipe the dust from it? Thank you. <laughs>